I have been trying to fly through some of this material in order to be sure that I'd get a lesson each week. And it dawned on me somewhere along that I don't have to cover an entire lesson every week. And this <laughs> I'm preparing the material and I've worked up lessons ahead. So I'm going to go ahead and finish for sure what we didn't finish last week. And uh, we may go a little different space. I've been talking quite rapidly and also uh, very little class response. And uh, I sure want you to be with me in these lessons. So uh, we may change the pattern a little bit. You have just received a lesson on the lost son, and I hope we get to that today, and I think we will, but we probably won't finish it either. And in regard to the one we had last week, uh, let me see, Billy and Judy, you weren't here, I don't think, last week, were you? Well, I'll get these other lessons to you later. Uh, if any of you like with the back lessons that we've already covered, in regard to lost time, and then last week we were studying lost opportunity. Uh, there are copies up here that you can pick up. And we will be starting today on page six of that lost opportunity. Because there was one of the areas we hadn't covered. First one we covered was lost Opportunity because of doubt that related to Israel as they were moving out of Egypt and wandered for 40 years. And we mentioned there was an elongated cemetery from here all the way to the plains of Moab where over 600,000 people died that could have gone into the promised land. That's beyond our ability to fully grasp. That many people lost an opportunity to be in a land flowing with milk and honey. And it was because of doubt, a lack of trust and faith in God. God had just demonstrated his power in conquering what was really a dynasty or an empire in that day, strongest nation as we think of measuring strength in a nation on the earth, Egypt. And they humbled themselves to the point they not only let the people go finally, but actually gave them gifts and urged them to leave. And with that kind of a demonstration of God's power, these people came down here, got up to about this point, sent spies into the land, and came back, ten of them, with a report, they're giants, they're stronger than we are. And the whole nation caved in with God having repeatedly, as we had in the outline, informed them that he would give them that land. But they doubted. They doubted God. They looked too much at the people there, their giants, the Anakims and others. And they lost an opportunity to go in the promised land. That was the first in that outline. The second had to do with lust when they came into the land and began to conquer, Jericho was taken, a big city. Little old Ai, they tried to take, 36 died. And the nation suddenly had a twist again of doubting what God had done to bring them into that land. And they responded with also fear and the problem was Achan. He had taken the spoils that they had gotten, some of them out of Jericho, buried them in his tent, 
and God was no longer with the people. So 36 died. They lost time. They lost people. And then Achan and all his family perished. Big loss again because they did not consult and continue to relate with God. That's pretty important, it's obvious. Then the third one we looked at, maybe even more sobering, lost because of a fear of God, his assignment. Christianity is not just an automatic, natural, or real easy situation. You have to think a little, have to study some, you have to work. All that's entwined being a Christian. And sometimes it looks so big that we think, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. And we looked at it last week from the standpoint of fear. Lost opportunity because of fear of God's assignments. It'd scare me to death to try to get up and teach class. I had a brother once tell me, Dayton, don't call on me for prayer. I don't feel like I can do that. I guess it was six or eight months later in a Bible class I called on him for prayer and he stumbled through a prayer and it's a few years later that I saw the same man. He said, man, I'm glad you pushed me just a little bit because he said, "Uh, I had too many fears. We can get fears, too many of them, and lose opportunity." Now we're ready for today. I'm going to move this thing out of the way. I just brought that down to give you an idea of how much real estate turned into a cemetery of a people who lost opportunity to be in the promised land. I'm getting this out of the way because I saw when it was up there, if I get behind this podium, I can't see half of you out here, so I wanted to stay in tune with you. Page six, Dan Ziegler will lead us by the reading of John 12, 42 and 43, and then we'll get into another lost opportunity. Verse 42, Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him, for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. Verse 43, For the love of the for they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. I don't know if we think very often when reading through that of how many people have lost an opportunity because of that kind of an influence. It can come up in several different dresses or different ways, but did you notice the word many Related to that, many of the leaders believed on him. I don't know how many were in the Sanhedrin. I know of Joseph of Arimathea, Nathaniel, and some others that definitely manifested an interest in Christ and what he is doing. This passage says many of them believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. Fear. What do they think? I'm afraid if I said this, they would do, and we start imagining. And some of the imaginations might be real. I'm not saying that this never happens, that anyone would react and respond against someone that would try to do what Christ asked us to do. In fact, some people will. But the last part of the verse shows their heart. Their heart was, they love the glory that is of men more than the glory that is of God. That can get right down weighty in varied environments and circumstances. And you lose an opportunity 
to redeem others maybe or certainly to honor Christ and confess him. Thus, we're going to look at that just a moment because I don't know of anything that probably is much more severe when it becomes a test in someone's life than this because it can relate to someone very close to you. So, first of all, just note that many of these leaders believed on Jesus, but they didn't confess it. Lost opportunity. They were in the presence of the Son of God. But the glory of men was greater in their hearts than the greatness of God in flesh walking among them. It's amazing how twisted our thinking can become and how illogical we can become. But it's real. It happened to them, and it's still happening. Let's try to get some more of that. Turn back to Matthew, the 10th chapter. Another passage that's there in the outline. In verses 32 and 33, Jesus said, Whosoever will confess me before men, him will I confess before the Father who is in heaven. Have your name confessed in heaven before God. Roll call, and your name is there. That's pretty good. Whosoever will deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father who is in heaven. Have you ever noticed what the context is immediately after that? Where would it be the greatest test as to whether or not we would confess Christ or not? That is the greatest test not to confess him and therefore to deny him. Look beginning in verse 34. Think not that I came to send peace on the earth. That's a little bit of a strange statement, but it's true. Even though he is in scripture referred to as the prince of peace, think not that I came to bring peace. Always tie in whatever is said in the word of God with the context. And there are certain areas where Christ is not a peaceful personality in our midst when we're around certain other people. Think not that I came to bring peace, but to bring a sword. For I came to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and their daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Man, that is heavy. When it's right in your own house, under your own roof, with your own loved ones, I guarantee you it's not always easy to stand for Christ if they have taken a course of relating in some way to the devil. That's heavy. And that's hard. And it can happen so many different ways. It can be different doctrines. It can be different lusts. It can be different lifestyles. It can happen a lot of ways. A brother or a sister or a mother or a father or an in-law And fear comes in our heart. The test is more than we want to deal with. Or maybe we don't think we know what to say, and sometimes we don't. That's hard. What was the context? If you don't confess me before men, that could include a brother or a sister or a mother or a father or an in-law. If we do not take the proper response toward Christ, 
He said, I have come to bring what like a sword, cutting, painful, hard, hurting. And you need to do something. But just like John 12, 42 and 43, even though you believe on Jesus, you might not confess him. That's the context that we're dealing where we lose an opportunity. In the outline, we have two or three quotes there. Jack Penn made the statement, one of the secrets of life is to make stepping stones out of stumbling blocks. You see, you could convert the sister or the brother or the in-law. And they, instead of being a stumbling block, they become a stepping stone. I'll probably in the next lesson look even more at the case of Saul of Tarsus. I'll guarantee you he was a heavy reactionary against Jesus when he was Saul of Tarsus. Did the Lord turn away from him? No, it appeared to him. Of course, when you're resurrected Christ, you've got a few credentials on your behalf. But he turned him into a fabulous apostle that would have died for Christ and may have. Probably did, certainly died in Christ. And there's what we mean by turning a stumbling block, Saul of Tarsus, into a stepping stone, the Apostle Paul. The other statement there by Margaret Thatcher, just below that, it pays to know the enemy, not least because at some time you may have an opportunity to turn him into a friend. Sure is fine when they're not only a brother in the family, but now they're a brother in Christ. So changes can occur. But the test is real. Lost opportunity because I didn't know what to say, when to say, what to say, and I didn't say anything. I did not turn a stumbling block into a stepping stone. I did not turn an enemy into a brother or sister in Christ. There's the challenge, and it's going on day after day. And I'm sure as I say these things to a class this size, some of you know we're living there right now over at our house or in our family. It didn't stop when the New Testament was written. I distinctly recall a time in Mendon, Louisiana, a lady had been introduced to me. I was able to go visit with her. I knew and she knew that she had cancer and it was progressing in her body. So her future was very dim physically and she had Bible questions she wanted to ask. And I had two real good studies with her. Seemed like her ears and her heart were open. And in the next study, when we were getting down to the area of the place and purpose of baptism in what Jesus taught, and then in this case, the act of baptism was involved. I just mentioned in Acts 8 that both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and they came up out of the water. And that baptizo, uh, the term that Jesus used of the command to be obeyed is an immersion or submersion. That's what the word means. And then I added that I know in the religious circles There were those who put water upon someone and they call that baptism. But technically it's not. It's a wrong action. 
may be, good, may be a good intention, but it's wrong action. And then I mentioned that they have those that I mentioned sprinkling, and because of the old covenant pattern of sprinkling blood upon the altar or upon one's garment to make it clean, things like that, uh, the term sprinkling is in Scripture. Not the same thing as baptizo, but it's there. And uh, just mentioned that here are ways that the devil deceives people not to do what the Lord commanded us to do. I was trying to teach it in a kind way, and I had no idea what I was doing because she hit me real heavy with, did you know you just condemned my mother by what you're saying? And I said, I don't know anything about your mother. And she gave me the story. A lady, I guess, that went to church services somewhere almost every Lord's Day. In the past, she was dead at that time. But that, that was the baptism she had was, as they called it, baptism sprinkling. And all the, I thought she was near obeying the gospel. I think she was. And she just kept that hammering in her thinking. You have condemned my mother to be lost. And in her heart and her rationalizing, I know my mother was a Christian. There it is, mother and daughter. The rest of the study didn't go well. I was uneasy. She was upset. And I left disappointed when I thought that might be the day she'd want to obey. She died two months later of cancer outside of Christ. Don't tell me this isn't real. I'll guarantee you it's real. And Jesus said, I came not to bring peace upon the earth. As loving as he was, as good as his new covenant is, good news, the way the devil twists the thoughts and all of people when he put a sister against a brother or a mother against a daughter or a father against a son. And I'll guarantee you it's heavy when it happens over at our house. And our house could be any of your houses. So lost opportunity again. Why? Because they love the glory that is of men more than the glory that is of God. You and I don't have a chance if we don't respond to this. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's God's power unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Four ways we looked at way opportunity slips away from us. Doubt, like Israel, 600,000 didn't go to the promised land, died in the wilderness because they didn't think God could give them a little country when he had just delivered them from the major governing power on the earth at that time as they left Egypt. But they didn't have faith enough to turn to God to do what he said anyhow and go on in. Lost opportunity because of lust. Achan just saw it. He wanted it. And sometimes we get to wanting things so bad that we will reject God in order to get our things. It can happen. And Achan took it. His family was lost. 36 men died and they lost some time. Lost opportunity because of lust. Lost opportunity because of a fear of God. 
God wanted me to be this, God wanted me to be that, and I never did develop because that'd scare me to death if I tried to do that. However you want to play that out, it's real. Some of us could easily succumb to a fear of God. His assignment takes too much to be a Christian. Too much involved in having to study the Bible like some people say we ought to study it. Well, it's not what people say. It's what the Lord says and how well we come to know it. And then lost, in this case, because of a fear of what he may think, she may think, they may do, or they have done. And we cannot reach them with the truth because they love the glory that's related to men in some way more than the glory that's related to God. Any questions you want to ask on lost opportunity or idea or thought? Well, I've been talking so much that all of you have forgotten you've got a voice, I imagine. But... Uh, get to the next lesson and we'll see how far we can go. Another way of being lost. Lost time, lost opportunity, now lost son. And again, we're dealing with something rather personal, aren't we? Look at the first part of that outline. You just received it today when you got here, so I want to read one or two sentences there that I think is quite sobering. Becoming a parent is a sobering step. A time-consuming task. An event tied to eternity. I imagine that the number here would even go down to the grandmother and grandfather level because you at one time were a mother or a father. Ruth and I have three. Concerned about them anywhere along the way? Oh, yes, all the time. And I imagine some of you have had that. It is a time-consuming task, this thing of bringing life into the world and then training and developing that life as the Lord wants it for sure. An event tied to eternity. And yet, anyone of age can become one. That is, a mother or father, male or female, rich or poor, Educated or uneducated, moral or immoral, all those types can become parents. And the next sentence is quite sobering. Struck me one day in Abilene, Texas. Yet among all the patterns of reproduction, there is no role so demanding or dependent as the parent child relationship. That's about the same words that were used by Judge Sam Davis Tateman, judge of the juvenile court in Nashville, Tennessee for many times there in Davidson County. He spoke at the lectures and made this point. He was standing at the Harpeth River outside Nashville and he saw the sand begin to move down at his feet, and he backed up. You, you just see sand start moving. You, it's a little bit eerie. And uh, he watched. I think he said there's eight or nine baby turtles came up out of that sand. Just been born. And he said, the little old rascals stick out their little head, look one way or another, and then they begin to move right on down to get into the river, never to see the mother or the father. And then he, in comparison, told of a mother who was busy in the house, and the four-year-old child woke up, got out the front door, went on out through the yard, and just a little higher up to the railroad tracks. And a train came by and killed her son. Four years old and still so dependent on mom and dad. 
That's what that sentence is talking about. The most challenging process of moving life from birth into early years on the earth is human life. That's how much a mother and a father is needed are needed in this process. So when we start talking about the family, it's not surprising that one of the most famous parables that Jesus taught was about a lost son, often called the prodigal son. Luke, the 15th chapter, if you want to turn to it, and we will highlight I think I've given you enough of information there in the outline for you to be able to follow along, but it's always good to have the text to verify if the teacher is saying what he ought to say. Down in the introduction, parenthood is a partnership with God. You're not molding iron or chiseling marble. You're working with the creator of the universe in shaping human character and determining destiny. That's what parenthood is. So Jesus taught the lesson about a father who had two sons. And you can start there in about verse 11, somewhere along there. And in the outline, point one, you'll notice we've got several parts below that, and we'll be looking at each one of them. First of all, there's the plea of the younger son who came to his father and said, Father, give me the portion of the land that is inherent to me. And that's how the story begins. And what that son did later is quite sobering. I put in there one this time a little bit of the grammatical factor because I think it's significant. You'll notice in that first line right after or with Father gave me the word dos, that's the word give in Greek. It's a second aorist imperative active of didymi. And the only reason I'm taking a little time to deal with grammar here is because It's a fairly important point in this story. First of all, the Greek grammatical pattern works by action. We work by time. Past tense and present tense and future tense with the verbs that we have. We deal time-wise with verbs. Greeks deal as to action. And in this particular case, the aorist tense, there's a first and a second aorist, and both of them mean point action. So in a way, this boy is saying, do it now, Dad. I want it now. At least he used a verb that was point action. And then look at the mood or mode imperative. Dad, you better do that or you won't be a good father to me. I don't know what all was behind it. I just know that even grammatically, this kid is making an insisting statement. Father, give me. I want it now. I don't know how he said it, but I know that grammatically, he was emphasizing, you better do this. And that's the way young people are sometimes. I know my dad, (laughs) well, I better not get off on that. But uh, he got tired of me saying, give me so often. Usually it's give me a dime, give me a nickel, give me. And back then that was worth quite a bit. But uh, give me is in young people. You notice the quote down there in this by... Frank A. Clark, a child like your stomach doesn't need all you can afford to give it. (laughs) 
Now, the stomach, we think we don't want that to go too long without getting attention. And children can sometimes get an urge and they want it today, not tomorrow, now. And it's real easy for us to give in. You love your children and you want to do the best you can for them. How many have said, I want my children to have it better than I did when I was young? And that might have been a good statement. Nothing wrong with the statement. It's just that that makes us very susceptible then to cave in to every request they make. And sometimes, as stated here, giving a child too much too early may mean his or her inner growth may come too late. They didn't take time to assess things like they needed to. I think of a case that happened when I was young out at Spade. This occurred at Olton. It happened this mother and father were members of the church. And they only had one child, a son. And they were quite well off financially. Big farmer, big barns, and quite a bit in the bank. And so they just showered that child out of love, you know, with anything they could get him or give him. And when he got up about a sophomore or junior in high school, he was probably the only boy in that county that had a brand new car. Mom and Dad, just, you know, it's our boy. And out of love, give him and I don't know that he even demanded that. I just know they lavished him with gifts. And I know how it all ended. The new car on the speedometer was registering 80 when they got to the wreck. One car accident, I mean one individual accident, He'd try to make a curve too fast, I guess. And their boy died when he was, I believe, a junior. Very, very sad funeral. Two loving, good mamas and daddies. But I'm sure they might have measured later how well they had made decisions of what was important in their boy's life. It can happen even with good intentions. Number one, the plea. That's the way some children are lost. Seemed like that was the way that boy was lost. Turn over to the next page. You have, well wait, maybe there is a B over there, isn't there? <laughs> the place. He took this inheritance and he went where? Into a far country. Do you notice the Greek term there, how they defined it, macaron? A great way, far, far off. Those far off. And then it adds this. Those remote from God. Now that's when far off gets to be a problem. Now, I realize there's another way in which the song that has been written in regard to God, He is every, if you had a good bass voice, where uh, my dad had a recording of a quartet and that bass just rumbled down there that God is everywhere. And He is in a way, but yet we can become separated from God. And that becomes a real problem when the far country is a far step in thought and principle and practice away from God. That's what we're talking about here. That's when it is exceedingly sobering. In Ephesians 2, 13, 17, Jesus mentioned, or it mentions that Christ went and preached to those who were near and those who were far off. 
That means people, maybe like an atheist or someone that's so far removed from God, he was ready to go there too. And that's what we're dealing with here in this boy going to a far country. Because what he did was certainly a long ways away from what the father had taught him. And thus the problems then began after that. I'm going to read one other passage and we'll close out because the first bell has rung. Over in Proverbs, turn to that as it deals with this idea of us going into a far country. It's just one brief statement really in the context here, but it's quite sobering. You see, I guess there in the outline, Proverbs 7, 6 through 27. I'm going to start about verse 4. Say to wisdom, you're my... You are my... What is that? Yeah, you are... And call out understanding, you are my friend, so forth. Well, then down in verse 6. For at the window of the house, I looked out through my lattice, or the window, and I saw among the people moving about a young lad, a youth, young man, He is passing through the street near her corner and he took the way to her house. Then notice, in the twilight and in the evening. It was not only to whom he was going, who is an adulteress or a harlot, but it was when he decided to go. Go at night. And in the outline, we just made the point that as young people grow up, they want to expand the borders of where they can go. Often they won't do this over here or over there because mom and dad won't see us. It can be that kind of thinking. And that's when they start wandering off away from God. And here, this young man is going to go down Context overall in that entire seventh chapter shows his, his death and is all because he got too far away from God. That's another way a child can become lost. They want to get far off. We'll study more on that. You've got the outline this week and you can study it on your own and we will try to finish it up, Lord willing, next week. Appreciate your presence and... Hope you have a good Lord's Day.